Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Imperial Lates Online, the latest in this evening public event series exploring research at Imperial College London. I'm Bryony Benjabbit. I'm an artist, curator and producer, and my work tends to explore the natural world and our relationship with it. Um, and tonight I'm delighted to be joining you to host a wild drawing workshop. And for this workshop, you're going to need some paper, um, a pencil, if you have a fine black pen, that'd be great. And definitely lots of colored pencils and crayons. I'm working with Crayolas and, and, and mixed pencils here. Um, and tonight's session will take us inside the British Garden Hedgerow um, to meet some of the animals and insects and plant life who call it home as we have a play with drawing the natural world around us and hopefully developing some drawing skills that you can take with you on your summer strolls. On this journey, I'm delighted to be joined by forest ecologist and conservation researcher Minerva Singh, whose career assessing bird and insect habitat suitability has taken her around the tropics of Southeast Asia, from Malaysia and Laos to Borneo, Cambodia and the Philippines. And we're going to find out a lot more about Minerva, her science and her thoughts on how we might address biodiversity loss here in the UK shortly. Um, however, a couple of housekeeping kind of pieces before we get started. So if you're watching us on YouTube, and you have questions for either myself or Minerva, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box under this live stream. Um, Maeve from the public engagement team at Imperial is here and will be passing these questions on to us to read out as we go along, um, as well as chatting with you all and posting links to further reading about some of the subjects we're gonna cover in the next hour. And as we work through the drawing exercises, we would love to see what you're creating. So make sure to take pictures of your pieces as you go and you can share them on Twitter or Instagram uh, using the hashtag Imperial Lates. And if you're not on social media, you can instead email a picture to us with your name on it um, and email it to lates at imperial.ac.uk. Um, if you do so during the session, we'll hopefully have time afterwards at the end of the session to kind of bring them up and have a look with everyone else here. But if not, we'd still be really keen to see your creations as the Imperial Lates team plan to create an online gallery next week with all of the work collected together in one piece, in one place. So that'd be great to see them all together. Um, so hopefully that's all kind of understood um, so we can get on with the workshop. And it's so great to see you, Minerva. Um, how are you doing this evening? I'm very well and I'm truly honoured to be with you all. Hello and I hope everyone can hear me clearly. I'm so excited about this. This is my first Imperial Lights and this is such a wonderful endeavour. Yeah, I'm really excited to, to share more of your research with everyone. Um, have you got your pencils and paper ready? Are you, are you going to be joining us with the drawing? I'm, I'm no good with drawing, but I may scribble out something or the other as, as an inspiration strikes. Sure, cool, okay. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned, you've been undertake undertaking a lot of research throughout Asia. And when we yeah. spoke a couple of weeks ago, um, we we're just starting to think about how this workshop might run. I was particularly interested in the work you're doing um, in Indonesia, because I'd recently spent some time volunteering at an orangutan sanctuary in the Bornean rainforest, uh, which was my first experience of overseas conservation in action and a fascinating insight into the social political kind of challenges um, that those who are trying to prevent biodiversity loss are facing on the ground. So I'm super excited to talk a bit more about Borneo with you later on in the, the session. As am, I, as am I. And I worked in the Malaysian Borneo. You were in Kalimantan and I was in the northern part of Borneo. And again, they both the countries, the Borneos of both the countries, they face massive challenges, but yeah. obviously they vary across countries and across the three countries that are in Borneo. Yeah, yeah, right. So yeah, it crosses the borders, doesn't it? But when we were chatting, we decided to focus more on on like the humble British hedge um, because we, what came across is we both felt really strongly that we need to find ways to pay closer attention to the, the biodiversity loss on our own doorsteps. Um, and hedges are just very familiar markings in the landscape. Um, so and that humble, they're heroic. And that's something we are going to explore. The heroic. There's no such thing as a humble hedge. <laughs> I like that. The hedge hero. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's get let's get started. So, um, first of all, the question is, what kind of hedge are we going to be making tonight? Um, so we may all think we know a hedge, but when was the last time we really looked at a hedge? You know, kind of a hedge is a hedge is a hedge, but sometimes they're really rambly and quite wild or unkempt. And other times they could be really manicured to within an inch of their lives 
or even plastic hedges. So there's a clip that I found on Twitter a few months ago, which like perfectly sums up the kind of hedges we will not be creating tonight. And I think we're gonna play it right now. If the internet will play ball. <laughs> Well, it looks like it's just loading. So they're going to share the link in the chat, but essentially it's a plastic hedge. So you can probably imagine it anyway. Um, and it's just a real kind of clear example of humans wanting to manage nature and imitate it without thinking about the wider impacts. It's kind of an egocentric kind of approach rather than an eco-centric mentality that, you know, and I think what I'm really interested in when I'm creating art is finding ways for us to feel closer connection with the natural world and part of it. So kind of really, are we, oh, no, we're not going back. <laughs> uh, really finding ways to embrace like the childlike glee of discovering and exploring and immersing ourselves in nature. Um, and so for this for this workshop, I was really delighted to be reacquainted with um, Brambley Hedge. Um, if anyone remembers, recalls the Brambley Hedge books, I've got my, my series here, the full complete collection of the Brambley Hedge stories that came out in the 1980s. And give us a shout in comments if you, if you remember this. Um, and it follows the adventures of mice um, in their hedgerow home. Uh, throughout the seasons. And there's just some amazing illustrations. I'm going to kind of just share a couple of them that have inspired um, the workshop tonight. Um, and essentially, we meet all the different families that live in the, the hedgerow. And so tonight, what we're going to be doing is drawing the hedges, can you see a bit better, as if we are inside them, as if we are the Brambley Hedge mice. Um, so we're going to be um, kind of the way that we're going to be orientating or kind of approaching the perspective is as if we're looking up into the um, into the hedge as a little mouse. And we're also going to be combining references from across the seasons because we can have artistic license. Um, we're creating a fantasy hedge tonight. So the, the main aim is to create uh, the best possible hedge for wildlife. So the exact opposite of the plastic imitations. So without further ado, if we can grab our pencils and if you have colored pencils, again, artistic license, you can choose any colors you want. I'm going to stick with browns and greens pretty much. Um, so we are going to, first of all, be putting in the structure of our hedge. So we might be um, drawing hornbeams or hawthorns or blackthorns, but really kind of thinking about um, this idea of us being really small at the bottom and um, kind of arranging the, the, the shrubs or the trees as if, um, as if we're looking up. So the, the base will be wider than at the, the top. So the, the branches will look smaller the further you go. Um, if it's helpful, you can actually um, grab a, a normal pencil and do some um, kind of semicircle marks, getting smaller and smaller and smaller up to the top, just to help you guide the lines of the of the hedge. Um, so imagine that you're at the very base and allow the roots to kind of come down and the roots will be much bigger than the the tips. So the roots, they'll feel a lot more kind of substantial. Thicker. And I think we have some images uh, to share of different kind of um, hawthorn and hornbeam hedges as an example, just to kind of jog your, your memories if you haven't looked at hedge recently. So there's an example like from the winter hedge um, and also a spring hedge. And like I said, you can totally mix up the seasons for this exercise. There is no, no one's going to be judging that the inaccuracies of other seasonal fruits and flowers. And you might want, if you have a different kind of color, um, different tone of brown, you might want to kind of make the color slightly lighter at the top. So it's darker at the, the bottom where it's closer to, to you as a brambly hedge mouse. So 
So as we continue to kind of draw in the structure, um, Minerva, could you give us a few pointers for things to kind of look out for in when, when we're creating a healthy hedge? Well, a healthy hedge is a natural hedge. So as you pointed out, it should not be manicured to within an inch of its life, and it should be a multi-species hedge to be more amenable to pollinators and other local biodiversity that need those species. So a co combination of hawthorns, lavender, fuchsia, primrose, again, and obviously having holes in there so the birds can fly through and having those rough twigs, the small rough twigs for the birds to nest. In fact, there's a hedge right outside my window. My cat's very fond of seeing it. And there was a little nest built in there by a bird and you had all of these twigs and then someone decided to manicure it. But again, you know, leaving, uh, leaving in niches in there for species to build their homes or to transfer the landscape and again making sure that we don't cut it too often i think it has been recommended that we cut hedges in two to three years so they're quite they, so there might be kind of some some straying um branches and sticks kind a of sticking out of them. yeah a lot of them branches and sticks okay because and um was, those little blackberries. Yes, so we're going to be adding in some foliage in a sec, and uh, definitely blackberries is going to be great, great fruit for, for our critters. Um, as well as also, if we're going to, whilst we're still sticking with the the, the wooded part of our hedge, um, yes. I think it's kind of advised to kind of put piles of, or not put, but allow piles of branches or twigs right. and kind of debris. Debris again of different sizes and shapes, so you'll have something very small, you'll have things that are longer. Again, the more uncut we leave it, and so as uh, since we are only building the structure and we are yet to add the uh, flowers and stuff, so I got ahead of myself. But making mm -hmm. sure we have uneven branches, uneven twigs, the debris that you mentioned, and then there are gaps, and you know, uneven yeah. surface. So go to town at the base of your hedge and just really allow lots and lots of kind of twigs and leaves to kind of fall because it's a great habitat for the insects. Exactly. So one, and then, oh yeah, make sure you say, so make sure we've got gaps in the, the hedge for birds, but also for hedgehogs as well, like lower holes for them to kind of shuffle through is important. And door mice, yes, of course, we can't forget our, our brambly hedge mice. <laughs> So um, then let's let's go to the plants that you were going to like. Let's add in the foliage. So as you were saying, some native flowering plants. So for example, um, honeysuckle or wild rose, um, brambles, nettles, ivy, bluebells, primroses, um, holly. You know, so let's let's get our greens, uh, all our different kind of greens out, and and make sure it's kind of really thick. So Drawing in the leaves of the um, corn flower because corn, uh, if you want to have a bird friendly head, say for example, in your garden, then corn flowers that's a good idea. Budelia globosa for bumblebees, and then you can have a combination of species. So, if you had a combination of hawthorn, snowberry, juneberry, and dogwood, then that would be a bird friendly hedge, and obviously. Mm. I was thrown in for yeah extra measure fantastic okay so like as we're drawing this in you can be quite loose with the the marks um particularly kind of i guess thinking keeping in mind this idea of perspective so if we're looking up you know the the leaves that you'll be drawing um further down will be bigger than the ones that you see at the top so at the very top you can Kind of create them more like a pattern, like just something a bit abstract, and and later on we'll be maybe adding in a little bit more detail at the base of the tree. Um, but yeah, add in as many different colours as you can of the different greens, different tones. And we always aim to have at least four different species minimum. So we are not looking for a mono species hedge. I mean, some of them can be effective as providing habitat for pollinators, but typically we need to look for at least having four to five species in our hedges. Mm. And I've had 
spread out so you can have the wildflowers in front and you can have your hedge, the, the shrubby, the woody part, the other the part that pinches and hurts in the back. Or you can have wildflowers surrounding your hedge. I think that would be beautiful aesthetically and again, have more species divided spatially so you don't stick everything together. Mm, yeah, so the layering of the hedge is really important. And so can you kind of, um, whilst we're adding in our different plant species, would you be able to kind of talk us through like why we should care about how healthy our hedges are? Coffee. Do you like coffee? <laughs> Love coffee. Run on coffee. <laughs> okay. Now the vast, uh, a lot of the most important things that we eat and drink, they come from pollinators. So pollinators, they are very important for sustaining global agriculture and certainly for sustaining British agriculture and the British hedges they support up to, to the best of what I recall reading, 80 different pollinator species. So things like in your hedges, you have pollinators like bumblebees, they rely on hedges, birds, small birds, they rely on hedges, butterflies, butterflies are, pro, are pollinators, not that, that most people think of them that way, but anyway, bumblebees, butterflies, they're also prolific poll pollinators and without hedges, it's difficult to sustain pollinators in our local ecosystems. And in case you're wondering why exactly do we need pollinator? I mean, a lot of people think we just need a pollinator sitting in a forest. No, but there have pollinators have been declining all over the world, especially the developed world. I mean, a couple of years ago, you had the bee collapse in the, the United States. So if the pollinators go away, then the chances are we won't be able to get, well, we, we won't be getting the the agricultural items that we consume without without really paying a second thought to them and artificial pollination techniques are going to be horrifically expensive and certainly not half as effective and we will be disrupting our natural food cycles so the idea of having these hedges is well we sustain pollinators and their natural life cycles so you know you have a bird that may eat a little insect that bird may in turn be eaten by something else. And, and then, you know, you have a bumblebee which is going to, you know, poll carry out pollination services. They need nectar corridors for that, rely on the nectar and hop from place to place pollinating. So that is what sustains the cycle of life. And once the cycle of life starts collapsing locally, then it just reverberates up. And then one fine morning you read about things like the colony bee collapse or 50% of our pollinators being gone. Mm. So that's why we are, we, we are not just sustaining a bumblebee. With that bumblebee comes a life cycle, its own food chain. It's part of a food chain. Yeah. The services, ecosystem services, pollination services that our pollinators provide, they run into billions of dollars. And it's it, we are hearing more and more about like that that um, the threat of losing our bees, and they are kind of I think getting a lot more. Um, this 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 crisis is getting a lot more kind of airtime, but also like the birds. It'd be great to hear a bit more because obviously birds are one of your your focus of your research. Yeah. Um, the bird life, I think it's like hedges support like eighty yeah. percent of our woodland yes. birds. Yeah, eighty percent of our woodland birds. So that's a lot. That's a lot. And in an urban landscape, you know, where you have these buildings and concrete roads, these hedges they can act as a corridor for birds and other mobile taxa to transverse a hostile urban landscape. You know, maybe mm. they can move from one woodland across our urban landscapes all the way to another woodland. So, in a way, hedges. And if planted properly, you can have an entire nectar corridor and the corridors have been recommended at small scale and at a large scale in different places, just as a way of sustaining pollinators. So, you know, it'll literally transverse the landscape, jumping onto these hedges and isolated patches of, you know, wildish 
for now. Mm. Yeah, we'll be talking a little bit more about that kind of the idea of of corridors and and linking of these kind of these untamed spaces, the, the importance of that in biodiversity in, the, in a little bit. But I think um, nectar corridors, yeah, 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 yeah. So I've never really thought of a hedge as a nectar corridor, but I will be looking at them <laughs> differently now for sure. I, I just wanted to really quickly check in on how everyone's getting on with the uh, the drawing. Um, so we're, what we're doing, we've add, I've added in some ivy, um, some brambles. Um, you can, if you want to add in some um, some berries, I think I might add in a few berries. Um, so hawthorn berries or blackberries. Um, yeah, let some kind of wild rose or honeysuckle kind of tendril up up your up your hedge. Um, and what else? Some go up a wall or something if you have those climbing ivy ivy creepers and stuff yes falling out of your hedge and and by the way they do prote they provide protective services to buildings and they do add some character oh yeah <laughs> they do and when they're not plastic <laughs> um, a plastic hedge <laughs> i'm gonna throw in i'm gonna throw in some bluebells because we're getting lots of bluebells at the moment and um and they kind of tend to nestle um, at the base of, of the roots of some trees that I'm I'm going to be dropping in here. Um, so in primroses as well, there's lots of those around right now. So yeah, just keep it quite loose with the drawing. And like I said, we'll add in some details a bit later. And you can, um, I'm, I'm being quite fast because I'm, I'm keen to keep chatting to Minerva, but um, there's lots of different species of plants that you can drop into your, your hedge. So clearly, you know, from what you've been saying, Minerva, hedges play a crucial role in the British landscape. But my understanding is that we've lost like a quarter of the hedgerows like that we had before the, the Second World Wars, like in the period yes. till now. It's been like devastating how much we've lost of the hedgerow. Yes, there has been a huge, uh, uh, I read a scientific paper that there has been a huge decline in hedges in the post-war period. So. Yeah, a quarter yeah. From after the 1950s, so that's quite right. a major loss. And that's a microsm of the loss in green spaces that we are seeing in United Kingdom and maybe and quite possibly in other OECD countries. So, mm. you know, green spaces mm. replaced by concrete jungles and matchbox upon matchbox of houses. What, what, there's a question that's come in from Pedro, which is, I mean, what could or what should one do to help reduce biodiversity loss and if we could focus this question if that's okay pedro just specific to the the, the british hedge for now like what what can we do to um mitigate this loss of hedges well first thing you need to know and believe that you can make a change don't think you are powerless you can make a change the first port of call would be Look around you, be more mindful of the hedges. Are they being cut down too often? Are they being super manicured? If you live in an apartment complex like me, write to the management people, asking them that you want more natural spaces, write to your city council, asking them what exactly are they doing to maintain pollinator biodiversity and hedge health in your local area, because you are paying taxes, you are paying for that. So yes, you can ask them and tweet at them and sort of make inquiries, spread awareness, tweet at these big supermarkets and ask them about well, transparency in their supply chains. Are they taking any specific measures to support biodiversity, pollinator diversity? And if they're like, there's a big fashion, well, I use the term fashion loosely of using British source products. Okay, it's British source. It's brilliant. I'm supporting the local farms, but what is my local farm doing to support biodiversity within that farmscape? So, you know, mm -hmm. I buy a lot of local produce, but and I think that's a good idea. But what I don't know is it's coming from say outside the share. But how biodiversity friendly was that farm? And yes, making our farms biodiversity friendly is as relevant and important as is, you know, making our urban spaces greener and more biodiversity friendly. Mm. Yeah. So 
so paying much more attention to what's happening really really hyper locally and like if we were to come across a hedge that you know that's looking i guess is like kind of neglected you know i guess it's also just paying closer attention and kind of clipping it or replacing it in places or removing litter wherever we can kind of just being more kind of aware citizens of of our shared hedges and when the summer comes i'm sure everyone's dying to bumble out of the well everyone is stepping out uh, one can always volunteer with the local organizations like I know I volunteered with Butterfly Conservation a great many years ago, and they provide opportunities for recording and monitoring, and you get together with a lot of people, and you walk around looking at butterflies. And great many years ago, I took part. Incidentally, I was that was my first year at university, and I was all soaking wet, and a group of people invited me for a cup of tea, and once the tea was done, they, had, they handed me that whatever shovel or thing. We are cleaning up the local hedges. Would you like that? I'm like soaking wet, but never mind. So yes, but you don't have to stumble onto those things. You can go online and see is there an opportunity because the local church groups and local conservation organizations, they all have all of these activities planned. Yes, I think yeah. There's, it's definitely increasing as well. There's a there's a question that's come in um, from Angela, which is, kind of touches on the, the experience that we've had. Well, it's all about the experience we've had in the last year, um, and I think people have become more hyper aware of their local area and in wanting to kind of um, make a positive impact on their their hyper local area. And she's asked, have there been any positive changes to biodiversity due to the changes that happened due to the pandemic that you've that you've noticed or or heard about? Well, in some parts, I mean, that depends where you look. So when human beings, they were not, well, you were not interfering with the natural order of things. You had more and more spe species coming out and exploring the urban spaces. And I think it was in Chile or somewhere. I don't recall reading that a jaguar managed to venture into the city to have a look. So, but I, I think on the whole, in many local spaces, you know, you have, biodiversity like mobile tax are coming out and exploring more now that we are not disturbing them mm. I remember on jaguars and leopards but yes I think certainly there, there has been an element of biodiversity becoming bolder <laughs> um I, I like yeah we'll leave the jaguars for now but we are going to add in some some animals uh, into our hedge so no jaguars, but I think there might be an image to share with some silhouettes of some of the kind of critters we might find in our in our hedges. If we could share that now, that'd be great. Thank you. So what we're going to do is, I mean, if you're right in the middle of kind of still adding your plants, carry on with that by all means. But um, I thought what we could do is draw in um, silhouettes of the animals that might be found in a really healthy British hedge and use um, your pencil or, or your fine pen for this. Um, I thought it'd be quite interesting to draw them as kind of outlines because they're normally quite hidden. Of course, they wanna be quite camouflaged. We're not meant to kind of really see them. So um, we'll be dotting them in and around our hedge um, as we continue chatting. Um, and hopefully um, you can keep sharing this, this, this reference image for everyone so we can keep uh, following, following some of these silhouettes. So as we carry on with this, I mean, obviously hedges are like a human intervention in the landscape. They're a way to set boundaries across agricultural land. Um, but we've, in this kind of human management, this interest in human management, um, you know, clearly with the, the environmental crisis we're facing with the biodiversity loss that's, that's happening all over the globe, we've overstepped the mark um, and gone way too far. And I thought this would be a good opportunity for you to chat to us a little bit more about the research you've been doing in Borneo regarding over management of landscape. So maybe you could start by kind of sharing with us what the primary research question was. Well, the primary research question, uh, I went to Borneo as a part of my MPhil and that was, uh, that itself was quite simple. That was to look at the changes in forest structure and biodiversity across a degradation gradient. And by a degradation gradient, what I mean is, the levels of management that forest had undergone. So I worked from an absolute intact rainforest all the way to oil palm plantations. And 
essentially it was to see that how hum human modification and varying levels of human modification they influence the ability of nat the natural ecosystem to provide ecosystem services like carbon storage biodiversity and so on mm. but it was carbon storage and biodiversity i didn't specifically look at ecosystem services and and so when you were conducting this research what kind of tools and techniques did you did you use on the ground uh, field trip well uh, i did a lot of biodiversity well the, for the biodiversity monitoring that I did in Borneo and other places, I mainly focused on birds and that involved going out at the crack of the dawn and walking across transects, recording all the birds and taking their geolocations. And so basically it involved a lot of walking around with binoculars. And I think, as you can see, I still have my, in that photo on the left, I still have some stuff that I'm carrying on my shoulder for the same. For measuring carbon storage, that involved measuring a lot of trees, so measuring their diameters and recording their species, recording the species name. And did you, but you combine this also with um, satellite imagery as well? Like was the kind of the macro and the micro of the kind of- Oh, absolutely. So with obviously how much can I walk? How much can anyone walk? So once I came back to the UK, then I took all, then I obviously computed the metrics that I computed using the field data and that I acted satellite imagery using something known as machine learning models to build landscape scale projections of carbon storage, the variation in carbon storage, what were the, and the variations in biodiversity, habitat suitability, and more to the point, what were the factors that adversely affecting, you know, things like species richness in an area. So, and to no one's surprise, I too discovered that distance from roads had an adverse effect on species richness. I mean, this is a well-established phenomenon, but it was still worth seeing in the context of a forest area that was supposed to be that protected. Mm. And this, so there's a question that's come in um, from Derek. Um, about about this research in Borneo, which is, have you been able to provide a convincing argument to the governments of the countries who are carrying out massive deforestation to make palm oil plantations? Well, we have several strong ecological and conservation centric arguments that we can and we have been giving to oil palm producing countries. There's no dearth of suggestions, but unless we compensate the opportunity cost of growing oil palm and or find substitute for oil palm in our supply chains then our arguments don't go very far and again oil palm is something that we use a lot well we use it in everything from cosmetics to processed foods to almost everything i can think of and recently well over the past few years there has been a push for having commodities like and impressing upon the big multinational nationals like Nestle to have oil palm free or deforestation free supply chains. Again, I'm not sure how much they are doing, but that's a question of supply chain, transparency and sustainability. But then oil palm is not the only culprit. Rubber is a big driver of deforestation and our modern economies are heavily, heavily dependent on rubber. And there was a big documentary about that this great global giant that the global economy is something of that source and you know without rubber our economies would collapse tomorrow so we have commodity intense economies and i don't know what is the best way of resolving that but till the point we are so commodity intense i, uh, I don't see my arguments or anyone else's arguments going very far yeah, I think, um, yeah, that kind of leads on to my next question of like, in the time that you've been working as a researcher, like, have you, have you sensed any kind of major shifts towards kind of facing that that huge stumbling block, that huge hurdle um, globally? And if so, to what extent? Okay, again, I don't know how relevant that is, and how much effect that will have on actual policies. But and social media has a big role to play so for all its toxicity. I think social media is great in that. So when I returned from Borneo, no one 
in my circle and no one on social media. There was no one I could think of who was interested in things like oil palm free, oil palm free supply chains. I used to be the freak show of any discussion <laughs> talking about that stuff. But suddenly, a little less than 10 years later, you had these big companies. I can look it up. Oh, I think it was Nestle coming out with, you know, we have supply chains that are deforestation free and you have advertisements talking about these products are going to destroy the habitat of an orangutan, don't do this. So certainly there's more awareness and with the power of social media, I know people are going forth and insisting on more sustainable products, greener products. Again, I don't know how, what kind of a systematic comprehensive change will that bring uh, bring on but social media is hugely powerful but we have to use it in a way that we can yes yeah really from the message like if we could do something like the GameStop mania you know a lot of us get together and systematically promote a cause on social media and direct that towards companies i don't see any reason why we wouldn't make a sustain a substantial change that could certainly happen but Again, who's going to organize the game stop mania for sustainable supply chains? That's the question. But having said that, even all of these different efforts coming from different sources, I think they are, made, they are making headway. So I'm positive on that. Yeah, I think through the conversations we've had, it's definitely you keep coming back to the collective um, and uh, being the, pe the people power. And I think just just really briefly, whilst you mentioned social media as a side note, um, if anyone really wants to share their drawings with us, we still really want to see what you're creating. Um, I've, I've, um, I've added in um, a, a couple of birds, um, a wood louse, a mouse and a butterfly. So I might be dropping in um, a toad in a second. Um, so yeah, just keep adding in your, your plants and your animals. Um, Something, a, a big theme for me with your um, research, Minerva, has been like um, the difference in the quality of nature or, or when the land is tamed or domesticated versus wild, unmanaged nature. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit around that and, and maybe kind of speak to the question that a couple of people have asked, which is really, you know, can we ever truly rewild the landscape or restore that lost kind of quality? Like, is it is it... Have we lost it for good? Um... Okay, now this is a slightly, I mean, what have we lost and what exactly was there beforehand? First thing, nature has been exploited by humankind since antiquity. I think there was this paper recently saying that human beings have been exploiting nature for 12,000 years. And so there's really no such thing as pristine impact ecosystems they, they've all been exploited including the deep forests of the congo basin but here the, now the question is we've lost a species rewilding or bringing it back i mean short of doing the jurassic park kind of thing yes <laughs> depending on the species and the context that is very much possible so you had great many years ago when the preswalski the last species of wild horses in the world that only lived in Mongolia that was like practically dead. So they carried out huge conservation efforts. They restored its habitat and then they could release some of those into the wild. Now in UK, they are making, UK and Europe, they are making efforts to rewild nature. I think bringing back wolves. Scotland is due to get wolves after 300 years. So it's certainly possible, but a lot will go into bringing that back. I, I don't think we'll ever go back to what was there 400 years ago. I don't know what was there 400 years ago, but I think that's still a good initiative because you will be restoring a lot of habitat, like restoring big ungulate species. Again, that provides a lot of benefits to your own landscape, a, a lot of natural ecosystem services. So restoring that habitat uh, you, you're not just putting a species in there, but you know, you're know you restoring, bringing back or restoring a lot of things. So yes, I think it's quite beneficial. Mm. And, the, and what was the kind of the difference in the quality of the landscape that you noted um, in Borneo? <sighs> that depends, difference in the quality. Of, I mean, de depends on the context. 
Now, great many decades ago, my paternal grandfather was in Borneo during the Second World War. And for him, it was a green hell that swallowed up entire battalions, you know, battalion after battalion, went into the forest, never came back. It was dense. It was that dense. And back then, most of Borneo was covered with forests. And till 1973, about 73% of tropical Asia was under forest cover. That reduced to about 51% by 2009. So by the time I ended up in the same place, 60 years later, you had a lot of that forest was gone. So it, it, it certainly wasn't what you had in the 1940s. Mm. Uh, it was heavily degraded. It could not swallow up a single battalion. Forget about swallowing battalion after battalion. And yes, you could hike through it, you could walk through it, and you'd reach human habitation. So there was no such thing as, you know, being cut off from the world. You had a lot, well, you had this oil palm boom. It was full mm -hmm. of plantations. It's like you could walk for kilometer after kilometer, drive for kilometer after kilometer, and only see oil palm, oil palm, you know. So there was a huge change. And I think that has brought about a massive decline in biodiversity and loss of ecosystem services. And according to the late Dr. Navjot Sodhi, who passed away many years ago, Asia is facing, Southeast Asia is facing a biodiversity collapse. And if things persist, you will have the kind of catastrophic biodiversity collapse that happened in Singapore and Hong Kong in the 19th century. You know, 95% of the rainforest was cut off. And then one fine morning, all of the species, they started collapsing. So you wouldn't associate Singapore or Hong Kong with being rainforest places, but they were. So it left mm. by the time my kids or grandkids go there, they may not, well, all of it may be gone. So, you know, starting from 1940s to a green hell, well, or a green sea, depending on how you want to see it to my time when it was heavily degraded to what's going to happen in the future, that worries me a lot. That's, yeah, that's a really rapid, rapid decline there, isn't there? Absolutely. And, and not just in Borneo. One of the last areas in tropical Asia that was like cut off from the rest of the world, that's the Myanmar-Thailand border. Even that has a road. I had a well, I had the distinct and dubious owner of being there, and they managed to cut a road through the last chunks of untouched. Well, I'm using the word untouched loosely, and it just makes me worry about what's going to happen. Yeah, to not that many. Yeah. Um, I think there's a good question that's come in from Nicholas, which is. Um, what ecological lessons learnt in Asia can be applied to help conservation of birds and other species in the UK? Okay, now this is an interlinked question because a lot of the phenomenon that you see in Asia and Africa and South America is a consequence of, well, it's a combination of the colonial history and the post-1970s neoliberal consensus. So, it is our consumption patterns and our neoliberal consensus that you see being reflected in Asia. And the lesson that the OECD countries and the Global South can learn is that it's important to come together. I don't believe in this concept of one party taking the lead and the other one following that won't work, but coming together, working to say, let us have sustainable and resilient supply chains, looking for tangible solutions that what is the best we can do. So the, the lesson that we can learn from Asia, the specific question, what exactly are we consuming? Where exactly is it coming from? How much damage is it caused to our local biodiversity and biodiversity beyond? And again, pushing all of these companies and our supermarkets to be more transparent with us. And only when we know what, where exactly is this material being sourced, because that again feeds into this huge topic of equity, human labor issues and things. It is only when we know, can we push our policymakers to give us more sustainable and resilient supply chains? 
isn't there also like something about um this like a similarity that like i kind of noted in uh, indonesia was just the the need for um people to not work in silo as well to be kind of collaborating a lot more and i think you talked a bit about this as well uh, a few weeks ago like with the kind of needing to kind of share resources share knowledge and kind of see this as a kind of a collective effort rather than competition um, oh, so, you so like you worked at the actually in indonesia but and i was in vietnam where i ended up you know collaborating with a local ngo which was trying to preserve uh, the grey shang ducks are very critically endangered primate and it turns out that the NGO and your sanctuary they are not talking to each other even your sanctuary in Borneo and the other orangutan sanctuary in Borneo they are not talking to each other they say they are not competing but you have one party so locally I see a lot of positive impacts of these mm. partnerships that you have okay America researchers from OECD countries going, lending their expertise to all of these places and obviously getting their papers and research grants in return. You know, it's a quid pro quid kind of a thing, which itself is not bad, but till the point you have this research project in Vietnam, you have another research project and conservation effort going on in Hainan. Then you had these in Borneo, unless they sit together, all are trying to preserve Asia's primates. Unless they sit together and start talking, then we'll see, okay, local scale growth, look something, things happening locally, which make us happy, but there won't be any regional scale growth or development. And we miss out on that collective intelligence and that sort of eliminates the ability of say. Yeah. It that would come. Yeah. Yeah, definitely felt like there was competition over resource. And then that also, uh, that something else that kind of bubbled up whilst I was there was just the fragility of the relationship with the, the farming communities, um, the kind of agreements about land use and land share and how easily that can actually break down, how quickly. Yes. So what happens is your local NGO is very good that it managed to set up a sanctuary, managed to get things going, but now they've hit a roadblock that... A relationship has broken down and your local NGO and the researchers involved in that project, they can write papers about it, but all of them put together may not have the resources needed to either restore that relationship or to push that farming community out and or find alternatives. But if you had a collective regional approach or a regional think tank or you had combination of what I envisage is combination of OE, of researchers from different parts of the world, local stakeholders, representatives from the villages, talking to each other at a regional level, the chances are you may not get a solution. But if all of them were sitting on the table, sharing ideas, hey, maybe you could learn from Vietnam. Mm. Or if there was a regional funding kind of a scheme going on like i know the asian development bank so if you had a issue kind of a scheme going on they could simply fund an endeavor to you know find alternative livelihoods for these people but till we don't come together we don't forget about well competition is good but till we have healthy competition and we sit together whom are we going to impress upon? So we want to find alternative livelihood for those farmers that are encroaching the forests. Yes, we can approach the Asian Development Bank, but if 20 organizations approach the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank or any other multilateral organization, we'll have more of a voice as opposed to just one research group saying, find them alternative livelihood. So we, then you can just write a paper. You won't see your paper having that much or your research making mm -hmm. any groundbreaking changes on the ground. And I, I guess it must be so frustrating as a researcher working in all these different areas and working with all these different partners, seeing them not kind of, seeing that lack of collaboration and that's not Asia specific, that's a global challenge. Global, like Human nature. That's human nature. That's game theories. You know, it's prisoner's dilemma. If I collaborate with you, if I put my cards on the table, you could shaft me. Mm. So who would you to blink first? 
who is going to put their cards on the table first. And I do see that, you know, United Kingdom has been signing all of these trade deals and stuff. And, you know, the, a post-COVID consensus is going to arrive at some point here when, you know, when the economic shock is over and countries, different countries, they start reassessing their priorities and stuff. One day, this nightmare will end. At that point, it might be a good idea to reconsider how we have been tackling all of these problems and maybe resolve this prisoner's dilemma. I mean, ultimately, a prisoner's dilemma is rarely resolved, but who's going to pull blink first? Who's putting their cards on the table first? And one role that OECD countries can do is, you know, maybe provide that space or the funding needed to make these different groups come together and you know, start putting your cards on the table. Yeah. It, how do you there's a question I think came in from Michelle which is like how does but I'm she's asking about the biodiversity loss and how that affects your morale but I'm also kind of interested as well like this kind of this this political aspect to your work or quality to your work like how do you keep yourself feeling positive and kind of motivated incidentally I fall into the same trap so uh, I know there's a micro level success and uh, they were talking about setting up a nature reserve in Vietnam to, pr to preserve that particular primate species. I know even though that may not help all the primates of Vietnam, let alone all the primates of Asia, that's still a positive step forward. So that keeps me going. So yes, I do focus a lot on these micro substantial gains, even though I know if they don't connect together, we are, we are marching at one spot. So I, I think every day on my LinkedIn, I do end up posting stories of conservation optimism, Every time something good happens, I'll share that. I share that. Yeah. So really celebrating the small victories. I'm going to come back to that in a second. I just wanted to um, just mention to everyone, if you've got your some of your critters in the, the hedge, for the final kind of five minutes or so, if you have your, your black pen, you wanted to add in some details to kind of um, define the, the, the plants or, um, yeah, the plants closer to the the base of your image so for example i'm kind of just drawing in some of the kind of veins um, uh, there's a very i mean there's a very relevant question from peter so while people draw i'll try to answer that Is okay there an alternative to palm oil can we not manufacture it in industry of course we could find alternatives to oil palm and even oil I mean, oil palm was not always so big, but the problem is that sometimes an old, the alternative could be worse than what you had in place, like something like coconut oil. Yeah, we could explore that, but the chances are even coconut oil has been contributing to deforestation. Now, manufacturing stuff in industry, I know they're trying to manufacture artificial rubber in that was at Goodyear tie-up people they're trying to manufacture artificial rubber I don't know how far will it go and will it meet the economies of scale you know oil palm is literally used in everything we mm. end up consuming so I, I think it's a good idea to look for industrial options like can we just manufacture something artificially always a good idea substitutes I would I mean I'd be very very cautious about substitutes but yes it's a good idea to explore substitutes and in the meanwhile what we can do is emphasize and on trying to have cleaner oil palm and I know a lot of pledges have been made by organizations and even Indonesia in the Indonesian government that they're providing us with zero deforestation oil palm so satellite imagery could come in play there and that we actually keep a very clear eye on if they're saying this is zero deforestation oil palm is it really zero deforestation oil palm and it may be the aid packages that we send to these countries conditional upon if you say it's zero deforestation make sure it's zero deforestation i know that could be seen as being that could be a slightly tough approach, a slightly problematic approach. But if you say de zero deforestation, we monitor it using satellites. And some of these satellites have a spatial resolution of 10 meters. So that's entirely possible. And start linking the trade and the aid that we provide to actually ensuring that 
these supply chains are cleaned up and have the same and the same with the industry. So if Nestle tells me that this is zero deforestation oil palm, that better be zero deforestation. Mm. Okay. So yeah, I think with well, 10 meters, that's an amazing kind of resolution to really kind of be able to monitor those those promises, those commitments. Oh, absolutely. So yes, I'm a I'm a big fan of sort of keeping well, you know, keeping an eye from the sky. Yeah. On all of these developments. And these are open source data. So yes, uh, I believe them I think we can monitor most parts of the world now. Let's um let's wrap up um now with a last kind of couple of questions see if there's any coming in right now and if you if everyone wants to kind of share their images again do um hashtag imperial lates do kind of get them up on twitter and instagram and we'll definitely be looking at them even if you don't get them in the next five minutes we'll be we'll be looking through after this workshop um i think um, i'm just going to have a look and see what other questions have popped up there's a nice one um from briar i hope i pronounced that right which is What's the most interesting or memorable thing you've done whilst being an ecologist? Oh, there have been a lot of them. But one thing that really made me proud was when I was in Laos, I encountered a wild meat market, like a wildlife trading market. And there were a lot of birds in there. They were sitting there in cages, whatever. Well, I was supposed to leave Laos the same day. We stopped whatever I, else, I, like the little bit money I was left with. I put all of that on the table, purchased all of those cages, took those birds to forests. And my the person who's my research assistant kept on telling me, no, 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 they, they're captive born. They won't fly. They'll never fly. They don't know how to fly. Well, I sat, opened the cage, sat around for five minutes, you know, trying to coax them out. All of them flew back into the jungle where they belonged. And I think yeah. that really inspires me. Yeah, we can maybe they'll be caught again because they're very they're too comfortable around human beings now. But yes, that was memorable. Can't fly mm. you. Maybe yeah. learn to survive in the jungle. I could imagine that being quite an exhilarating moment. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. I remember watching that these birds and they were refusing to step out of their cages. And there was, you know, those people, my research assistant would go to them and they'd go back and say, you know, give them a finger. They'd put their little paws over there. Sorry, their little claws over there, peck you with a beak, all very friendly. And suddenly they decided we don't need you anymore. We are flying. Mm -hmm. They remember. <laughs> they remember. And even the captive ones, like the captive bred ones, it seems that they had that instinct of flight with, within them. And I found that fascinating that indeed, if they were captive born, how did they know that they can fly? I mean, uh, I think I'll have to speak to an evolutionary biologist about that, but that was so exhilarating. Yeah, that's that's a different workshop. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that is, that's a beautiful image. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing all of your, like, you know, this has been a really interesting kind of dive into your research. I know we've just skimmed the surface. Um, there's there's an image I think that's come in um, that, that's that been shared on Twitter. So I don't know if- I can't maybe... see it, but I'd love to. Ooh, that's lovely. And I can imagine a nest right in it. Like I can imagine a little nest and um, bird family sitting right there. Yes, that's fab. There, yeah. is, there is a nest. And very soon it'll have little birds sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoying their new home. Thank you for sharing oh, that. I love the green uh, leaf tips at the top as well. So please do keep sharing your fantasy hedges with us. And when you, you head out over the summer, just pay a little bit closer attention to our hedges. And if you feel like it, you know, get your sketchbook and your pencils and kind of sit at the base of the hedge and, and draw it. I really encourage you to kind of get in the hedge <laughs> and uh, and nurture the, the hedgerows that are close to you and around in your local area. And I think what's kind of really come across strongly in the, the message that you've shared, Minerva, is like, you know, really kind of focusing on, um, yes, the individual actions that we can take, but also the importance of community kind of collaboration and and the kind of collective consumer power and um, these kind of small connected acts and how this can kind of reverberate. You know, that's what we need to kind of make any kind of significant changes or kind of influence 
the those that can uh, make those huge changes. And as you were saying earlier, also celebrate the small victories. I think it's so lovely that idea that the daily LinkedIn share of of those small uh, victories. Thank you. And remember to volunteer. So you have butterfly conservation that I know of, and I'm sure there are going to be a whole lot of endeavors. I mean, finally, that when when the summer comes, I think. Of course, keeping all the safety precautions in place, I think we all need to go out and have a blast with nature. So walk around, take your smartphone, take those pictures, post those hashtags, because a lot of them, they do get a lot of people interested. Mm. So you use social yeah. media for doing something nice. If you're on Instagram, Twitter, post those. I mean, whenever I post pictures of my hedges and stuff, I always get likes and comments and again, you get the message going. Certainly, and I think definitely in the last year, we've all become far more aware of our local areas and really celebrating and, and valuing it. So yeah, may that long, like, I hope that continues. So I'm really gutted that this is like, this hour's gone really fast. I thought it might, but we're up on time, we're over. It's gone, it's two minutes past eight. So thank you so much to our guest, Minerva Singh. Um, and thank you to everyone watching at home for tuning in and providing some excellent questions of your own at the same time as producing your own wonderful art. Um, yep, yeah, just to remind you of the hashtags, you know, hashtag Imperial Late, share on Twitter and Instagram your drawings or email your drawings to late at imperial.ac.uk. We would love to see them. And a recording of this workshop will soon appear on the Imperial College London YouTube channel for you to watch again or share with your friends or colleagues whenever you want. Um, and a link will also now be posted in the chat um, to an evaluation form where you can tell us what you thought of the event. So if you can take just five minutes uh, to fill that in, we'd really appreciate that. We'd love to hear what you thought. And otherwise, that's it from me. And I wish everyone a really good evening. And thanks again for joining us at Imperial Lates Online. Thanks for joining us. Good evening and stay safe. Go out <laughs> and enjoy the nature whenever you can. <laughs>